Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhary once again and uh, today you already know that I'm going to discuss about valvular heart disease. Okay, among the valvular heart disease, I'm going to discuss about aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, then mitral valve stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Uh, many of you are already following, I have seen and in the chat box also. Uh, I have seen that you have started. You have started messaging. Good morning, everybody. Someone has written good evening. Yes, good evening. So let's begin with the class. I hope that you'll enjoy the class. Actually, this valvular heart disease is more important, not only for theory but also practical point of view. Okay, you really need to know how to diagnose a case of aortic valvular disease or mitral valvular disease. How do you manage such case? okay so first begin with the aortic stenosis okay so what are the causes of aortic stenosis cause can be congenital there may be bicuspid or unicuspid abnormality in the valve degenerative calcification okay that is one of the commonest cause degenerative calcification so among the elderly it is very much seen the prevalence is quite high in the elderly because of calcification. Rheumatic fever, again one of the important cause of aortic stenosis. But uh, just to mention that in rheumatic fever, the commonest valve which is involved is mitral valve. I have already talked about rheumatic fever in the last class where I have discussed that the commonest valve to be involved in rheumatic carditis is mitral valve. Sometimes along with the mitral valve, aortic valve may be involved and in the long run it may lead to aortic stenosis. Isolated aortic valve involvement is less common. And sometimes due to radiation also someone may develop aortic stenosis. So these are some common causes of development of aortic stenosis. How do we grade aortic stenosis? We grade aortic stenosis depending on the area size okay aortic stenosis can be graded as severe moderate or mild aortic stenosis when we say mild aortic stenosis when the valve area is 1.5 to 2 centimeter squares normal aortic valve area is more than 2 centimeter squares okay so just remember that normal aortic valve area it should be more than 2 centimeter squares when it is in between 1.5 to 2 cm square, it is known as mild aortic stenosis. When it is in between 1 to 1.5, then it is known as moderate aortic stenosis. And when it is less than 1 cm square, it is known as severe aortic stenosis. We really need to know how to grade aortic stenosis because the management of aortic stenosis depends on the severity, depends on the valve area, how much is the valve area. So this is about the types or gradings of aortic stenosis. Just a diagrammatic representation, we all know that aortic valve lies in between the left ventricle. This is the left LV, left ventricle and this is the aorta. Okay. So aortic valve lies in between, this is the valve, it lies in between left ventricle and aorta and during left ventricular systole, the blood from left ventricle is pumped out into the aorta via aortic valve. So this is the aortic valve, okay. It has three cusps or three leaflets, okay. So if there is aortic stenosis, stenosis of this valve, what will happen? There will be difficulty in propelling or ejecting the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. So the hemodynamic abnormality, what is happening in aortic stenosis, we need to know. So once we know the hemodynamic abnormality, we can really correlate with everything. We can correlate with the pathophysiology, clinical findings, patient symptoms, everything. Okay, so what is happening? Stenosis of the valve so that blood from the left ventricle cannot be ejected properly into the aorta. Okay, so pathophysiology as I was talking about, what happens? 
usually the left ventricular outflow obstruction left what is left ventricular outflow left ventricular outflow is just i will show you the diagram left ventricular outflow this area okay this area is the left ventricular outflow just before the aortic valve just before the aortic valve this area is known as the left ventricular outflow tract okay so what happens the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction may be present at birth or it may increase gradually over the course of many years okay what happens when there is obstruction or stenosis of the left ventricular outflow or aortic valve at the level of aortic valve the contractile performance is maintained by the presence of concentric lv hypertrophy so what does it mean as i said left ventricle cannot pump out the blood properly into the aorta because of stenosis aortic stenosis or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction what happens that as a compensatory phenomena left ventricle walls gets thickened so that force of contraction is more it wants to contract more forcefully that's why there will be hypertrophy which is also known as concentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle what do we mean by concentric hypertrophy the terminology is important concentric hypertrophy means there is increase in wall thickness as well as there is increase in left ventricular mass okay and there will be compromisation in the cavity suppose suppose this is normal left ventricle okay this is the left i'm just talking about cross section we have uh, suppose we have done a cross section at the level of left ventricle so this is the left ventricular wall and this is the left ventricular cavity what happens when there is concentric hypertrophy in concentric hypertrophy it will become like this it will become like this okay so this is the left ventricular wall which gets thickened over a period of time and you can also see there is reduction in the cavity size also okay so this is actually a compensatory phenomena okay because the left ventricle has an increased afterload because of aortic stenosis left ventricle wants to pump more forcefully so there is concentric hypertrophy okay development of concentric hypertrophy these are temporary adaptation by left ventricle but ultimately what happens concentric hypertrophy is not a good thing in the long run so in the late stage these adaptation fails okay and ultimately patient develops left ventricular failure so this was about the pathophysiology which is quite interesting if you understand it it is really interesting okay the pathophysiology what is happening in the left ventricle because of aortic stenosis now if i talk about the clinical features many a time the patient they do not have any clinical feature for years you will not know if someone has aortic stenosis also until uh, patient has uh, patient is suffering for many years and then patient develops symptoms so what are the common symptoms when patient develops symptoms what are the common symptoms dyspnea dyspnea means shortness of breath so dyspnea is one of the very common symptom of aortic stenosis the other one is angina angina we have already discussed about angina it is a kind of chest pain where you feel retro sternal pain and the pain will be like squeezing type okay like a constriction around the chest or it will be like squeezing type of pain that is angina okay the same kind of chest pain we see in coronary artery disease we may see in case of aortic stenosis as well exertional syncope that is one more important clinical feature of aortic stenosis why there will be exertional syncope okay because the left ventricular left ventricular afterload increases the cardiac output will decrease okay in the long run there will be reduction in the cardiac output and because of reduction in the cardiac output on exertion patient will develop syncope okay these three are known as the 
cardinal features of aortic stenosis okay cardinal features of aortic stenosis so just remember that dyspnea angina syncope these are the cardinal features of aortic stenosis if the patient is presenting with these symptoms you can really think of aortic stenosis and you need to evaluate the patient properly later in the course what happens there will be increased weakness there will be marked fatigability there will be increased weakness there will be peripheral cyanosis okay all because of reduction in the cardiac output there will be cardiac cachexia what is cardiac cachexia cachexia is a terminology it is used mainly for cancer patients where the patient develops cachexia cancer cachexia we know about but there is something known as cardiac cachexia as well so what is cardiac cachexia cardiac cachexia is actually it is the loss of weight loss of edema free weight by more than 5% over a period of 12 months or less okay suppose someone has some cardiac illness and the patient loses weight by more than 5% over a period of 12 months or less along with the patient should be having anorexia fatigue okay these things if present then we call it as cardiac cachexia okay so in case of aortic stenosis in the long term the patient will develop cardiac cachexia as well then the orthopnea i have already said orthopnea means breathing difficulty on lying down immediately after lying down if the patient lying down flat i mean if the patient develops breathing difficulty that is known as orthopnea the patient will also have symptoms of pmd what is pmd pmd means paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea i have already discussed about pmd in my previous class so i will not go into the detail but just know that pmd is the episode of breathlessness which patient develops after 1 to 2 hours of sleep okay and the patient has to sit up with a uh, patient's legs dangling on the side of the bed okay patient has to sit up for quite some time then the patient gets relieved slowly examination what are the things you will get in examination okay physical examination very importantly if you look at the pulse if you examine the pulse there will be pulses pervers aortas which is also known as Okay. Can anybody uh, tell about pulses pervers aortas? What is the other name of it? Pulses pervers aortas. Pervers means low volume. Okay. Means low. So what happens in aortic stenosis because of the reduction in the cardiac output? the pulse will become low volume and slow rising okay that is known as pulses pervers aortas okay if anyone know the other name of pulses pervers aortas can write down in the chat box someone has asked to take a video echo uh, definitely uh, i do echo so sometime i will take a video of aortic stenosis if i get a good case i will take an echo video of aortic stenosis and definitely i am going to share with you all blood pressure narrow pulse pressure at leg stage fall in blood pressure definitely there will be reduction in the cardiac output because left ventricle uh, cannot pump out the blood and at the end left ventricle fails also so there will be reduction in cardiac output leading to fall in blood pressure systolic blood pressure so when there is fall in systolic blood pressure definitely the pulse pressure will become narrow let us discuss what is pulse pressure okay pulse pressure is the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure so if systolic blood pressure is going down that means the pulse pressure also will go down so pulse pressure will become narrow okay the normal pulse pressure it is said to be in between normal pulse pressure it is usually in between 30 to 60 mm of mercury okay that is the normal pulse pressure if 
we examine the carotid, there will be thrill on the examination of carotid arteries. Thrill or shudder, we say it. Okay. Thrill, actually, it is a clinical finding. I cannot really explain what is a thrill. Uh, when you examine many patients only, we'll come to know what is thrill, actually. But thrill is basically palpable murmur. What murmur we are hearing? Murmur is because of turbulence of blood. If the blood flow is laminar, okay, laminar means straight. If the blood flow is straight, which is normal laminar flow, there is no murmur. But whenever there is stenosis or regurgitant lesion, there will be turbulence of blood, okay, resulting in murmur. And a palpable murmur is known as thrill, okay. Ventricular apical impulse displaces laterally, okay. Left ventricular apical impulse, that is one of the very important points when you do clinical examination. You talk about apical impulse in the inspection and palpation everywhere. So, in a case of aortic stenosis, what is happening? As I said, there will be hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Ultimately, the left ventricular apex will go down and out, we say. Okay? If there is left ventricular hypertrophy, the apex goes down and out. What, do you, uh, what does it mean, down and out? Normal apical impulse, it lies at the fifth intercostal space. Left fifth intercostal space, half inch medial to the mid clavicular line. Okay. Normal apical impulse lies half inch medial, medial to the mid clavicular line in the left fifth intercostal space. So whenever there is left ventricular hypertrophy, what will happen? The apical impulse will move down and out. Down means it will go below fifth intercostal space and out means from the normal position, which is half inch medial to mid clavicular, it will go outside. Down and out. If you find an apical impulse like this, which has displaced down and out, you know that there is left ventricular hypertrophy, okay, which very commonly you find it in case of aortic stenosis. At the same time, I will just mention that in case of right ventricular hypertrophy, the apical impulse will go out. Hence, it will go laterally. So, this is about apical impulse. What will be the apical impulse on examination of an aortic stenosis patient? And there will be palpable S4. Okay. Now, what causes S4? Okay, the fourth heart sound. What causes S4? I'm sure many of you must be knowing. If you know, just let's see. If you know it, then please write it down in the chat box, live chat. Okay. I was asking a question. What is pulsus parvus attardus? What is the other name of pulsus parvus attardus? It is also known as anacrotic pulse. When in the clinical classes you talk about pulse, you will come to know about all these different uh, names of different types of pulse. So, anacrotic pulse or pulses parvus attardus is typically found in case of aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis. Okay? Now, if you know what is the reason of fourth heart sound, what causes fourth heart sound, please write it down in the chat box. I will come to that later on. So, in case of aortic stenosis, you will get a palpable S4. Means when you do the palpation, you can palpate S4. Coming to auscultation, okay, very important. Auscultation, you will get a murmur, definitely because there will be turbulence of blood. Blood cannot be pumped out from the left ventricle to the aorta, so there will be turbulence inside the left ventricle, which will result in a murmur. Okay, so bicuspid aortic valve, congenital bicuspid aortic valve, there is usually an early systolic ejection sound. Okay, normally in aortic stenosis, what murmur we get? We get ejection systolic murmur, which is also known as mid systolic murmur. 
it's systolic murmur or ejection systolic okay ejection systolic murmur in case of bicuspid aortic valve we will get an early systolic sound okay early ejection systolic sound there will be paradoxical splitting of s2 okay we know that s2 splits in the fashion of a2 p2 okay a2 and p2 p2 comes after a2 that is a normal splitting of second heart sound okay aortic sound comes first and then comes the pulmonary sound but in cases of severe aortic stenosis there will be paradoxical splitting because a2 will come after p2 okay so what happens in paradoxical splitting the p2 will come first and then a2 will come okay this is one of the very important finding and an s4 is audible at the apex i have already mentioned you can palpate an s4 while doing the palpation the bicalaria so on auscultation also you will get s4 audible okay so these are the auscultatory finding of aortic stenosis the murmur i was talking about it is an ejection systolic murmur okay so there are many things you need to describe when you talk about a murmur so how will be the murmur of aortic stenosis timing of the murmur it is an ejection systolic murmur what part of the systole okay systole can be early mid and late okay or it may be a hollow systolic murmur that means whole throughout the systole there will be a murmur so aortic stenosis will result in a mid ejection systolic murmur how is the character of the murmur that is the second point when you describe a murmur it will be low pitched rough and rasping character where it is best heard or best audible it is loudest at the base of the heart okay and when you listen to the murmur you always make the patient sit up and lean forward why so because the base of the heart will come more closer to the chest wall when you make the patient sit up and lean forward so you can hear the murmur better so loudest at the base of the heart it is heard in the second intercostal if it is if it is heard in the right intercostal space then you need to think otherwise okay sorry if it if it is heard it should be heard in the right second intercostal space okay that is the aortic area and you need to auscultate on the herbs area also okay which is more important for the aortic regurgitation herbs area i will come to that when i discuss about aortic regurgitation okay so need to auscultate not only in the aortic area that is the right uh, uh, inter uh, second intercostal space you need to auscultate over the carotid also as i have already mentioned on palpation there will be carotid thrill or shudder so on auscultation also you will be able to hear the radiated murmur of the aortic stenosis in the carotid arteries so it will be transmitted upward along the carotid arteries okay sometimes it may be transmitted to the apex okay i'm saying normally the murmur of aortic stenosis it should be transmitted upwards into the carotid but sometimes it may be transmitted to the apex also you will be able to hear the ejection systolic murmur in the apex and it is known as gallavardian effect that is also important gallavardian effect or gallavardian phenomena okay so this is about the clinical findings coming to the investigations okay what are the investigations you are going to do from the typical symptoms and your clinical findings you really can diagnose a case of aortic stenosis but again you need to confirm your you need to confirm your diagnosis with some of the important investigations you can do i'll just take 15 seconds break and have a sip of water okay so 
okay of course what are the findings we will get in the ecg we'll get left ventricular hypertrophy of course we have said already there will be left ventricular hypertrophy so we'll get the finding in ecg also i will not go into the detail of the criteria of left ventricular hypertrophy when i take ecg classes i can discuss that there will also be left ventricular strain pattern okay what is left ventricular strain pattern that is also uh, i will discuss uh, during uh, while discussing the ecg but in lateral leads you will get stt changes in case of left ventricular strain okay chest x-ray what are the things you will get in case of chest x-ray there will be cardiomegaly okay heart will be enlarged because the left ventricle is getting enlarged calcification may be seen in the aortic area or lateral view okay so these are the important finding cardiomegaly and calcification on lateral view echo okay echo is the echocardiogram is the diagnostic modality by which you know if the patient is having aortic stenosis or not so when you do an echocardiogram you will find there is thickening of the aortic valve there will be calcification as i said degenerative calcification is the commonest cause of aortic stenosis reduced systolic opening of the valve leaflet so because of stenosis there will be reduced systolic opening left ventricular hypertrophy will be there you can calculate left ventricular ejection fraction as well to see how is the systolic functioning left ventricular ejection fraction to see how is the systolic functioning of the left ventricle and you may also be able to see coexisting valvular abnormality if there is any other valvular abnormalities also you'll be able to find it out okay as i said in rheumatic carditis involvement of aortic valve isolated involvement is not so common it is most of the time involved along with mitral valve so these are the echo findings you need to remember which you may get in case of aortic stenosis and with the help of doppler doppler study is also uh, done while doing an echocardiogram only when you do a doppler study you will be able to grade the severity of aortic stenosis from the doppler flow spectrum okay uh, so actually it uh, sees uh, how is the blood flow the direction of the blood flow the pressure the gradient everything so from the doppler of the aortic valve you can see the severity of aortic stenosis and we can see if there is associated aortic regurgitation is there or not okay and uh, see the valve area if we can calculate the valve area we can also create the severity of aortic stenosis cardiac catheterization cardiac catheterization actually it is one of the investigation which is uh, suggested for all the valvular abnormalities or any cardiac abnormalities per se to see all the structures the direct visualization of all the structures so invasive assessment of aortic stenosis can be done you can see the chambers you can see the other valves as well coronary angiography it also has to be done okay in a patient of aortic stenosis to find out if there is any coronary artery disease It's there or not okay so these are the important investigations you do for aortic stenosis not only for aortic stenosis i will uh, tell you in other valvular heart disease also these are the investigations only you do you do an ecg okay you do an echocardiogram you do doppler study you do cardiac catheterization and you do coronary angiograms these are the major investigations you do to confirm your diagnosis of aortic stenosis other than these investigations you may do other routine investigations also or you may do investigations which may suggest you what is the cause of aortic stenosis okay so this is about investigations coming to the natural history of aortic stenosis as i said in the last class also every disease has a natural history means when it starts when someone has the disease then how it will progress okay so death in patients with severe aortic stenosis it most commonly occurs in 7th or 8th decades of life okay very uh, luckily or uh, fortunately 
now there are very you know sophisticated surgical intervention for aortic stenosis cases but previously when there is no surgical intervention or no proper treatment were available or widely available the average time to death after the onset of various symptoms was once someone has presented with angina pectoris okay the average time to death was three years syncope average time to death three years dyspnea average time to death two years congestive heart failure if someone has developed the symptoms of congestive heart failure then the time to death was 1.5 to 2 years but that has much improved these days so now i will be talking about the management of aortic stenosis how to manage a case of aortic stenosis but before i go into the management proper we need to know the recommendations and stages of the disease because i will show you when i mention about a flow chart some recommendations will be there and the stage of the disease you need to know if you want to uh, specifically manage the case so recommendations class one procedure should be performed or are indicated class 2 2 a and 2 b 2 a is reasonable to perform the procedure class 2 b may be considered okay this level of recommendation it goes true for any and every disease it is not something which is only meant for aortic stenosis but if you read about other diseases also there will be recommendations okay level of recommendations these level of recommendations you need to follow for every disease okay so you can just remember that coming to the stages of aortic stenosis so what are the stages there are four stages of aortic stenosis okay stage a b c d c is again divided into c1 c2 d divided into d1 d2 d3 okay a c1 c2 d1 d2 d3 like that so what is stage a when you know the patient uh, has risk factors for the development of valve dysfunction that is stage a okay only the presence of risk factors stage b there is mild to moderate valve disease but the patient is asymptomatic so mild in stage b the patient is asymptomatic but the patient has mild to moderate underlying valve disease as I have already mentioned, once a patient has aortic stenosis, it will take many years for the development of symptom. Stage C, the disease is severe in nature, but still patient is clinically asymptomatic. That is stage C. Okay. Not going to stage C1 and C2, that is okay to remember only the C. Stage D, severe symptomatic valve disease so when we say that the patient has stage d aortic stenosis you know that the patient has become symptomatic okay and only patient has a uh, patient when has severe disease for some quite a some time then only patient will develop symptoms before that patient will have no symptoms okay stage a only risk factors stage b there is mild to moderate valvular disease but no symptom stage c severe valvular disease no symptoms stage d there is symptoms okay stage d1 i was saying stage d1 refers severe aortic stenosis and a high valvular gradient d2 low flow low gradient and low left ventricular ejection fraction d3 low flow low gradient preserved left ventricular ejection fraction why how how it can be preserved it is because of compensatory hypertrophy of the left ventricle okay so stage d1 symptomatic with severe aortic stenosis and a high valvular gradient next stage low gradient low flow low left ventricular ejection fraction and stage 3 d3 there is stage d3 there is low flow low gradient aortic stenosis and preserved left ventricular ejection fraction that is because of compensatory hypertrophy of the left ventricle now coming to the treatment algorithm okay if you look at if you look at the treatment algorithm there will be severe aortic stenosis where the velocity 
through the aortic valve is more than 4 or 4 meter per second okay and the mean pressure gradient across the aortic valve is 40 or more okay that is that denotes severe aortic stenosis okay severe aortic stenosis with v max v max means valvular gradient more than 4 or 4 pressure mean pressure gradient 40 or more these two things you need to know okay for the treatment purpose the maximum velocity and mean pressure gradient across the aortic valve if the patient is symptomatic okay if the patient follows this criteria of severe aortic stenosis and patient is symptomatic that is stage d1 i have already said then you go for a aortic valve replacement avr stands for aortic r stands for aortic valve replacement so if the patient is symptomatic you straight ahead go straight away go ahead with aortic valve replacement if the patient is asymptomatic an ejection fraction is less than 50 or patient requires other cardiac surgery okay or maximum velocity is 5 or more and pressure gradient 60 or more okay then in these conditions also you need to go for aortic valve replacement if the pressure gradient is more than 3 also and the patient has low surgical risk you need to go for aortic valve replacement so the main thing is that you need to do an aortic valve replacement that is the ultimate option we have before that we can manage symptomatically but again we know once the patient has developed symptoms of aortic stenosis that means the patient has severe aortic stenosis okay that also for quite a long time so in that case definitely once the patient is just remember that once the patient is symptomatic most of the time you need to go ahead with aortic valve replacement you need to advise the patient about aortic valve replacement okay if i talk about uh, the maximum velocity where it is 3 to 3.9 and pressure gradient of 20 to 39. Then also if you look at the ultimate option that is again aortic valve replacement. So that is what okay you need to remember. That was about aortic stenosis. Now let's know about aortic regurgitation. Okay. So as the name suggests, aortic regurgitation means when after the uh, systole, what happens? After the systole, the aortic valve gets closed. Means left ventricle pumps out the blood into the aorta, systole is over, then the aortic valve will get closed and the diastole will start. Now what happens in aortic regurgitation? The valve cannot close properly. Okay. There is some gap when the valve closes and because of the gap there will be leak of blood from the aorta to the left ventricle. Okay, if you remember the image. For this image you will know. So this is LV. This is LA. From LV arises aorta. Okay, so this is the aorta. So if there is incompetency or regurgitation in the aortic uh, in the uh, aortic valve, what happens? Once the aortic valve closes, there will be regurgitation of the blood from aorta into the left ventricle during diastole. Okay. So that is about aortic regurgitation. So we all know that it was just a revision. What is aortic regurgitation? Coming to the causes of aortic regurgitation. There are valvular cause and root disease. Aortic regurgitation may be as a result of a valvular involvement or it may be as a result of root dilatation also. Aortic root dilatation. So what are the valvular causes of aortic regurgitation? If you talk about the valvular causes, Congenital bicuspid aortic valve. Bicuspid aortic valve can result in aortic stenosis as well as aortic regurgitation also. Endocarditis. 
infective endocarditis along with vegetations. I will talk about infective endocarditis later on. Rheumatic fever, myxomatous degeneration, okay, traumatic syphilis and ankylosing spondylitis. So these are also some, uh, these are rare of course, but some important causes of aortic regurgitation. Coming to the root disease, okay, disease of the aortic root. So aortic dissection, cystic medial degeneration, Marfan syndrome, one of the uh, abnormality in connective tissues, bicuspid aortic valve, non-syndromic familial aneurysm, aortitis and hypertension. So these are the important causes of root disease, aortic root disease leading to aortic regurgitation. So please remember this cause, there are not many, okay, only the important causes has been listed out here. Now what I was saying, this is the left LV, this is left ventricle, okay, this is your aorta, aortic valve. So, after the systole, aortic valve should be closed, but see, there is a gap, okay, because of this gap, there is a leakage of blood or regurgitation of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle, giving rise to aortic regurgitation. This is the cross section where again you can see there is you know, incompetence it means valve cannot close properly. Okay, so here is the gap which results in regurgitation of blood from aorta to LV, left ventricle. Pathophysiology, hemodynamically what is happening? Okay, hemodynamically what happens? The stroke volume ejected by the left ventricle is increased in patient with aortic regurgitation. Why so? Okay. Why the stroke volume will increase? It is because, I will just go this picture. Yes. So, uh, here, just uh, behind the aorta, just behind the aorta, here lies your LA. Okay, here lies your atria. Sorry, sorry. Here lies the left atria. So what happens? Now left ventricle has two inflow. Why two inflow? Because left atria also will propel the blood into the left ventricle, okay, through the mitral valve. And there will be regurgitation of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle. So the amount of blood left ventricle is getting is much more than the normal situation. So left ventricle is receiving blood from the left atria that is normal. Left ventricle is also receiving blood from the aorta because of regurgitation. So huge amount of blood will be and because of increased blood volume in the left ventricle the stroke volume will be more. Okay, Cardiac output will be more. So that is why the total stroke volume gets increased in case of aortic regurgitation. Increase in the left ventricular end diastolic volume, that is left ventricular end diastolic volume means, as I said, it is receiving blood from two sources. It constitutes the major hemodynamic compensation for aortic regurgitation. Regurgitation is a state in which left ventricular preload and upload are both increased. Okay. But what happens? Ultimately, all these adaptive measures, they fail. Left ventricular volume increases because of regurgitation. Because of volume overload, the left ventricle gets dilated over a period of time. Why it gets dilated? Because naturally, it has to accommodate more amount of blood. So, it gets dilated as a compensatory phenomena. But ultimately, again, this compensatory phenomena, everything fails. These are only short-term adaptive phenomena. If you remember about aortic stenosis, I say in aortic stenosis, the valve wall will get taken as a compensatory phenomena. That is concentric hypertrophy. But in case of aortic regurgitation, because of volume overload, the left ventricle will become dilated to accommodate the uh, increased amount of blood inside. Symptoms. Okay. If we talk about the symptoms, it can be divided into acute symptoms of acute aortic regurgitation or 
chronic symptoms of chronic aortic regurgitation. Acute severe aortic regurgitation, the left ventricle does not get so much time for compensation. Okay, the left ventricle does not get so much time for dilatation. So what happens? There will be pulmonary edema and ultimately patient will develop cardiogenic shock. So the presentation is very acute. The patient will present with severe breathlessness. Okay, severe breathlessness, chest pain in acute AR. Chronic AR, what happens? There is long latent period of 10 to 15 years. Okay, so until patient has the disease for 10 to 15 years, the patient will not have any symptoms. Okay, what next? What are the symptoms which will be noticed? There will be palpitations in lying down. That is a very catchy point we need to remember. We always talk about palpitation, palpitation. But palpitation, whenever you take history of palpitation, you need to ask if there is any positional variation of palpitation. If there is positional variation of palpitation, that means palpitation becomes more on lying down, then you really need to think about regurgitant lesion of the heart, like aortic regurgitation. Angina. Just like aortic stenosis, here also patient will have angina. Exertional dyspnea, patient will have shortness of breath and exertion. Orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. This orthopnea, nocturnal dyspnea, exertional dyspnea, uh, uh, orthopnea, these are all actually features of left-sided heart failure, okay? left ventricular failure. So, that is why you see all these features in case of aortic stenosis as well as aortic regurgitation where the left ventricle fails initially. Coming to examination, okay. On examination, what you'll get? I have discussed about the examination of aortic stenosis also where the pulse will be an acrotic pulse or pulsus pervus septardus. Now, in this case, the pulse will be water hammer pulse. Okay. It is again a classical variety, water hammer pulse. What is it? What happens in water hammer pulse? When you feel the pulse, there will be a rapid upstroke, okay, followed by a rapid downstroke, okay. Why rapid upstroke? Normally, actually, pulse has two waves. Normal pulse, okay, normal pulse, it has two waves. One is percussion wave wave denoted by B the other one is tidal wave denoted by T okay so uh, normally what happens these waves of pulse are not felt because of the vascular tone but some abnormal situations will arise when you can feel the pulse differently okay from the normal situation so in water hammer pulse, there will be a rapid upstroke you can feel followed by a rapid downstroke. So why there will be rapid upstroke? Rapid upstroke is because of, as I said, the stroke volume will be more in aortic regurgitation because the left ventricle is accumulating more amount of blood. So because of the rapid, uh, uh, rapid gushing of so much of blood into the aorta, there will be a rapid upstroke in the pulse you will feel followed by there will be all the blood will run into the periphery. Okay, all the blood will run into the periphery, which is also known as peripheral runoff. Because of this peripheral runoff, the pulse wave will fall again, rapid downstroke. Okay, during clinical classes, uh, you will come to know how to do examination of water hammer pulse, which is very important and very interesting as well. Once you see, you will never forget about water hammer pulse. Peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation. Again, this is quite interesting. The peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation. There are many peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation, and most of them are because of increased cardiac output. Aortic regurgitation is considered as one of the hyperdynamic situation. There are many hyperdynamic situations where the cardiac output increases. So it is one of them, and because of hyperdynamic situation, there will be different peripheral signs. Though there are many signs, I will talk about few signs in my next slide. Left ventricular apex will be down and out. I will not say again. Previously, I have just described what is down and out left ventricular apical impulse. It will be hyperdynamic. Okay, hyperdynamic means it will be ill-sustained. 
when you examine, when you try to palpate the apical impulse, it will be ill sustained. Okay. Diastolic thrill will be felt at the left sternal border. Okay. Diastolic thrill. Why diastolic thrill? Because there will be a diastolic murmur, early diastolic murmur in the aortic regurgitation. And thrill, as I have already said, thrill is a palpable murmur. So there will be a thrill during the diastole. Systolic thrill may also be palpable in a suprasternal notch and transmitted upward along the carotid arteries. Why there will be systolic thrill? Diastolic thrill is there, but why there will be systolic thrill also? If anyone knows, please write it down in the chat box. Okay. So I was talking about the peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation. There are many peripheral signs, but just let's know about a few signs. If you come down from head to toe, what are the signs? Okay, there is something known as lighthouse sign. Lighthouse. What is lighthouse sign? Lighthouse sign, there will be alternate flushing and blanching in the forehead. Okay, alternate blushing and uh, blanching in the uh, forehead that is known as lighthouse sign. There is something known as Landolfi sign. Landolfi. What is Landolfi sign? In Landolfi sign, there will be contraction of the pupil. If you look at the pupil, there will be contraction of the pupil during systole. Okay, so there will be alternate contraction, dilatation, contraction, dilatation of the pupil. That is Landolfi sign. There is something known as Muller sign. What is Muller sign? Muller sign is the pulsation in the uvula. If you ask the patient to open the mouth and you look at the uvula, there will be pulsation in the uvula. There is something known as D Muzet sign. D Muzet sign. What is D Muzet sign? D Muzet sign is the toe and fro head nodding. Okay, toe and fro head nodding like that. So that is. Uh, again, it uh, like it is in relation with the cardiac cycle. In the systole, there will be extension of the head like this. Okay, so to and fro head movement. That is D Muzet sign. If you look at the nail bed, okay, there will be alternate flushing and blanching again. But you need to compress the nail bed, and then you can see alternate flushing and blanching. That is known as Quincy sign. And So once you listen to the lecture and once you read the book, you will really remember this sign. They, are, they all have these beautiful names. Now, one more sign in the eye, I forgot. If there is retinal arterial pulsations, you can see that is known as the Baker's sign. Okay, Baker's sign, retinal artery pulsation visible. If you get a pulsatile liver, that is known as Rosenbach sign. Pulsatile spleen, that is known as Gerhard sign. Gerhard sign. Okay. How to remember this Rosenbach and Gerhard? Which one is spleen, which one is liver? It is sometimes confusing, isn't it? So I will just tell you how I remember. Just remember that. You can just remember like that. Pulsatile liver means Rosenbeck. Liver ends with R. Rosenbeck starts with R. So liver, Rosenbeck. Okay. So this is about how you remember. Now, there is something known as hill sign. What is hill sign? Normally, the upper limb and lower limb blood pressure, it there is a difference of less than 20 millimeter. But when the difference increases, suppose the femoral Arterial blood pressure is more than 20 millimeters. Systolic blood pressure I am talking about. Systolic blood pressure of the femoral arteries is more than 20 uh, millimeter of mercury from the upper limb, that is brachial, then you call it as hill sign. Okay, that is also present. Pistol short femoral. What is pistol short femoral? Pistol short. In pistol shot femoral, when you put your stethoscope on the femoral artery, you will get a booming sound. Okay, that is known as a pistol shot femoral or also known as trob sign. Trob sign. Okay. And 
parental, there is something known as Durosius sign. Durosius sign. Okay. Durosius sign means when you compress the femoral artery distally, okay, you put your stethoscope and you do distal compression. You put your stethoscope over the femoral artery and you compress the femoral artery distal to the stethoscope, then you hear a diastolic murmur. Diastolic murmur. And if you compress proximally, you will get a systolic murmur. So this is about Jerosia sign. So these are the few important signs you can very well get during your clinical examination. So these things at least you need to remember. Okay. This was about inspection. Now coming to the auscultations. What are the auscultative signs we may get? There will be an absent A2. Because of aortic regurgitation, the A2 will be absent. There will be a systolic ejection sound in case of bicuspic aortic valve. S4 you may get again. Yes, I was asking what causes S4. Has anyone answered that? Let me see. What causes S4? Before going into the details of this cardiac, uh, you know, diseases, valvular diseases, any cardiac diseases per se, you need to know about the normal cardiac cycle. What causes S4? S4 is because of uh, atrial contraction. Okay, when the atria contracts against a non-compliant thick ventricle during the rapid uh, during the uh, late filling phase of ventricle, okay, that is S4. So S4 you will get in aortic regurgitation also. Murmur. What type of murmur you will get? You will get, as I said, you will get an early diastolic murmur. Why diastolic murmur? Because the turbulence is occurring during diastole, natural. As I said, the aortic valve will get closed. After the systole, it will get closed. Aortic valve closed means diastole starts. Okay. So, during diastole, there will be backflow of the blood from the aorta to ventricle. So, there will be a diastolic murmur, early diastolic murmur. Why early? Because as soon as the valve gets closed, okay, improperly closed, there will be turbulence of blood and regurgitation. So, it will be a high-pitched, blowing, decrescendo diastolic murmur. Decrescendo means the intensity goes down at mid time. It is best heard in the third intercostal space along the left sternum border. Okay. When the murmur is loud along the right sternal border, it suggests that there is some aneurysmal dilatation of the aortic root. Okay. It should be heard in the left side, but if it is audible in the right side, the murmur I am talking about, if the murmur is audible in the right side, you know that there is aneurysmal dilatation, aneurysm of the aortic root. Okay. This is about the murmur of aortic regurgitation. Other than early diastolic murmur you will get some other murmurs also okay a mid systolic ejection murmur why you will get a mid systolic ejection murmur it is a functional murmur basically when there is increased amount of blood in the left ventricle which tries to pass through the aortic valve into the aorta because of huge amount of blood passing through the same valve there will be creation of a functional aortic stenosis. That's why you will get an ejection systolic murmur. Very importantly, you get an Austin Flint murmur. What is Austin Flint murmur? It is because, why the Austin Flint murmur? It is a diastolic murmur, mid-diastolic murmur, soft, low pitch, rumbling, mid to late diastolic murmur. Why it happens? Because the aortic jet, regurgitation jet will hit the mitral leaflet, anterior mitral leaflet will be hit by the regurgitant jet which will result in a functional mitral stenosis, right? That is why there will be a mid-diastolic murmur known as the Austin Flint murmur. It is different from the mid-diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. Here the regurgitant jet is hitting the anterior mitral leaflet resulting in a functional mitral stenosis, okay? So this is about the Murmur. So you will get three types of murmur: early regurgitant, early diastolic murmur, mid diastolic murmur, that is Austin Flint murmur, 
and amid systolic movement that is because of functional AS that is because of functional AS coming to the investigations I have already mentioned the investigations are the same as you uh, do for aortic stenosis you need to do an ECG you will get the left ventricular hypertrophy left ventricular strain pattern do a chest x-ray you will get cardiomegaly and sometimes if there is dilatation of the aortic root you may be able to see it in aneurysm of the root of the aorta okay MRI and CT in Joe are better for root dilatation so if you are suspecting a root dilatation you need to go ahead with an MRI or CT in Joe echocardiogram you can see the left ventricular size left ventricular function injection fraction and any other coexisting valvular abnormality doppler as i have already mentioned by doppler you see the severity of aortic regurgitation cardiac catheterization you do you find out the magnitude of regurgitation lv function coronary angiography to see for coronary artery disease. so this is just like aortic stenosis you do the investigations Coming to the treatment algorithm, okay, this is uh, the protocol how you manage aortic regurgitation. But to make it simpler for you, it is a little complicated. To make it simpler for you, I will just say that if the patient has severe aortic regurgitation, okay, severe aortic regurgitation, symptomatic or asymptomatic, you need to do an aortic valve replacement unless is followed okay unless left ventricular ejection fraction is 50 percent or more left ventricular lv esd stands for left ventricular end systolic dimension that is 50 or less left ventricular end diastolic dimension that is 65 or less okay you in these cases you do only periodic monitoring other than these things if it is not followed Almost for every cases, you do an aortic valve replacement. Okay, that is the easy way to remember. In cases of acute aortic regurgitation, as I said, the patient will present with acute onset pulmonary edema, chest congestion, dyspnea, uh, chest pain. What do you do? You try to relieve the patient of the congestion. You try to relieve the acute pulmonary edema by giving intravenous diuretics. That is the magic drug for pulmonary edema. And vasodilators you can use like sodium nitroprusside. Operation has to be done on an urgent basis. Okay. Beta blockers are best avoided in acute situation. And of course, surgery is the treatment of choice and is usually necessary within 24 hours of diagnosis. So we need to be really fast in diagnosis, making the diagnosis of acute aortic regurgitation so that we can treat the patient on time within 24 hours we have only a 24 hour time window within which we need to do the surgery chronic aortic regurgitation how do we manage you can use diuretics you can use vasodilators like ac inhibitors or calcium channel blockers or hydrolysin okay so use diuretics use vasodilators like calcium channel blocker, hydrolyzing AC inhibitor, okay. Beta blockers and ARB, angiotensin receptor blockers, are useful in cases of aortic root enlargement, okay. They may even retard or stop the progression of aortic root enlargement. So remember about beta blocker and ARB, angiotensin receptor blocker, they're useful to retard the rate of aortic root enlargement in young patient, okay. Surgery, as I was saying, okay, surgery, I have already said when you need to do surgery and when you can monitor the patient without doing a surgery, okay. If left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50, left ventricular end systolic dimension, that is LV, ST, more than 50, or a left ventricular diastolic dimension, that is left ventricular end diastolic dimension, more than 65, you need to do surgery, okay. Otherwise, remember only this criteria. So, in this criteria, you need to do surgery. Otherwise, you can, you know, uh, monitor the patient. Periodic monitoring can be done. So, this was all about aortic valve disease. Okay. If you have any query regarding aortic valve disease, you can ask in the chat box. Because next, we'll go into the mitral valve disease, mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Okay. 
So again, I'm asking, uh, requesting if there is any uh, query, you can ask in the chat box. Any query regarding aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation? Any question you can ask? Query you can ask in the chat box. We can ask later on also. You can ask later on also. Let's go into the mitral valve disease. Coming to mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. We all know that mitral valve lies in between the left atria and left ventricle. Okay. The normal mitral valve orifice is area of the mitral valve orifice is 4 to 6 cm square. Up to 2 cm square the patient remains asymptomatic. But when it goes below 2 cm squares, patients usually become symptomatic. Okay. Less than 1.5 cm square is referred as severe mitral stenosis. Okay. Normal area valve area 4 to 6 cm square. Up to 2 cm square stenosis also patient remains asymptomatic. When it goes below 2 cm, patient becomes symptomatic. Less than 1.5 cm square is known as severe mitral stenosis okay so this is the lv this is la and this is the valve of mitral stenosis what are the major causes rheumatic fever is the most common cause of mitral stenosis okay most of the time Rheumatic carditis is involved the mitral valve only. Mitral valve involvement may be in the form of isolated mitral valve involvement or it may be in the form of mitral valve along with aortic or other valve involvement. Congenital cause of mitral stenosis, parachute valve or core triatrium. What are these? Parachute valve means mitral leaflets, they are attached with the papillary muscles via body tendon. We know that in left ventricle there are two papillary muscles okay so there will be papillary muscles like this muscles okay and the these are quadi tendon okay these are quadi tendon tendon like structure that's why quadi tendon so valve leaflets will be attached with the papillary muscles with the help of quadi tendon there are two papillary muscles in left ventricle so when the leaflets are attached with a single papillary muscle by quadri tendon, that is known as parachute mitral valve, core triatriatum. What is core triatriatum? We know that there are two atria, left and right. If there is a, a membrane, okay, if there is a fibromuscular membrane which divides one atria into two, that will make three atria. Suppose right atria has a division by a membrane then there will be two chambers in the right atria and plus left atria so that is known as the core tri uh, atriatum mitral annular calcification with leaflet involvement SLE rheumatoid arthritis myxoma okay left atrial myxoma myxoma is a tumor of uh, heart infective endocarditis with large vegetations over the mitral valve these are the common causes of mitral stenosis coming to the pathophysiology of mitral stenosis right so what happens if you know the pathophysiology hemodynamics you can really correlate with all the features and all the findings the flow of blood is from left atria to left ventricle normal flow but because of mitral stenosis the flow is you know flow is restricted so what happens when the left atria
So what happens when the left atria is not able to empty the blood into the left ventricle, there will be increased pressure in the left atria. So pressure will be increased. What happens if there is increased pressure in the left atria? We know that pulmonary veins drains into the left atria, isn't it? Four pulmonary veins will be there which drains into the left atria. So whenever there is increased pressure inside the left atria, there will be back transmission of back pressure into the pulmonary veins. Pressure will rise in pulmonary veins followed by rise in pressure in the uh, pulmonary arteries also which will lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension and ultimately there will be hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Why hypertrophy of right ventricle? Because right ventricle has to pump against the pulmonary artery. So rise in pressure in the left atria, back transmission of pressure into the pulmonary vein, pulmonary vein to pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery to right ventricle because all these are connected. So ultimately there will be right ventricular hypertrophy and failure. So if you are asked which ventricle is affected first in mitral stenosis, your answer should be right ventricle. Okay. Which ventricle is affected in aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation? That should be left ventricle. But in case of mitral stenosis, the ventricle to get, effect, to get affected first is right ventricle. But, but later on, of course, there will be biventricular failure. So that is about the pathophysiology. Clinical features, if I talk about the clinical feature, most patients begin to experience disability during the fourth decade of life. Okay. The commonest uh, age group for rheumatic fever was 5 to 14 years. Okay, So if they develop recurrent rheumatic fever, they will develop rheumatic heart disease and during the fourth decade of life, usually the rheumatic heart disease patients, they do present. The remains asymptomatic until the stenosis is less than 2 cm square. Okay, I have already said. And then after that, they will have fatigue, exercise intolerance, okay, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea will be raised JVP because of right ventricular failure, okay. Jugular venous pressure will be raised. I will not talk about JVP in detail because later on you are going to learn about JVP. There will be edema. Ascites, okay, as a part of cardiac failure, there will be edema, ascites. Patient may have palpitation. Why palpitation? Because mitral stenosis is very much prone for the development of atrial fibrillation. And once the patient develops atrial fibrillation, there will be palpitation. Patient may have hemoptysis. Why mitral stenosis patient will have hemoptysis? This is again an important clinical question. There is something known as pulmonary apoplexy apoplexy. So what happens in pulmonary apoplexy? There will be rupture of small small pulmonary and bronchial vessels. Why? Because as I said there will be increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature because of transmission of back pressure from the left atria. So there will be pulmonary apoplexy that is rupture of the small small pulmonary vessels resulting in hemoptysis. Cuff, chest pain, thromboembolic complication. Because of mitral stenosis, patient will develop atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation will result in formation of clot inside the left atria. Once the clot is dislodged, it will result in thromboembolic complications like stroke. So, patient of MS with AF, okay, MS with AF, atrial fibrillation, they develop clot inside the left atria and they are more prone to develop stroke. That is known as cardioembolic stroke. Cardiobolic stroke. Coming to the sign, okay, what are the signs that there is some um, purplish pinkish rash over the mother area and there will be some cyanosis also in the nose of the tips and lips that is known as mitral phases. It is not very common in Indian patients, okay. Clinically, practically, we hardly see mitral phases in mitral stenosis. Jugular venous pressure reveals prominent A waves. Again, I am not going to the detail, but just know that JVP has three positive waves, A, C, and V, and two negative waves, that is X descent and Y descent. Okay, this is about JVP. The A waves will be 
prominent. A wave denotes atrial contraction. So because of mitral stenosis, okay, blood cannot be pumped out from the atria to ventricle. So the left atria will contract more, okay, to overcome the resistance of mitral stenosis. So because of contraction of the atria, the JVP, A wave will be prominent. There will be parasternal lift, which is also known as heave. Okay. Heave indicates, para, left parasternal heave denotes right ventricular hypertrophy. And as I said, right ventricle will be hypertrophied first in case of mitral stenosis if you follow the pathophysiology. There will be diastolic thrill again because of MS. There will be diastolic murmur, mid-diastolic murmur. And if the murmur is palpable, there will be a diastolic thrill. Auscultation, you will get a loud S1 that is very, very typical of mitral stenosis. So, just remember loud S1. Okay, you will get a loud P2. If there is development of pulmonary hypertension, you will get loud P2. Pulmonary hypertension causes loud P2. S2 will be closely split. Okay, A2P2 split will become closure. The A2OS gap reduces okay there will be reduction in the a2os gap what is a2 a2 is the uh, aortic component of the second heart so what is os os is opening snap when the mitral valve opens in case of mitral stenosis there will be a uh, uh, like a clicking sound that is known as opening snap it is a high pitch sound there is a gap in between the aortic valve closure and opening of the mitral valves. That gap is known as A2OS gap. Okay, normal A2OS gap is 40 to 120 millisecond. Millisecond. But in case of mitral stenosis, okay, if the stenosis is severe, the inversely related with the gap. Severity is inversely related with the gap. More severity of mitral stenosis, less the a2OS gap. Okay. About murmur I was talking, it will be a diastolic, mid-diastolic, rough, rumbling murmur, low pitched. It is heard best at the apex with the patient in the left lateral recumbent position. Okay. So whenever you're auscultation, uh, whenever you're doing auscultation for mitral area or apex, you need to ask the patient to lie on the left lateral side. When patient lies on the left lateral side, the apical area becomes more closer with the chest wall. Okay, so that is why you need to ask that. Once the patient develops cardiac failure, right ventricular failure, they say there will be congestive hepatomegaly, there will be pedal edema, ascites, and in the lungs there will be crepitation, sometimes pulmonary edema and bilateral pleural effusion. These are the signs of congestive cardiac failure. Okay. Last class I have discussed about heart failure, congestive heart failure. So by now, you, if you have followed the class, you know what are the signs of heart failure. Okay, congestive signs of mitral stenosis. Okay, what you get on examination. Coming to the diagnosis again, uh, the same investigation you do. ECG you will get P mitral. I will not go into the detail of ECG. Okay, P mitral denotes left atrial enlargement. You may get features of atrial fibrillation right ventricular hypertrophy we all know these things from the pathophysiology okay chest x-ray enlarged left atria and there may be signs of pulmonary venous congestion there will be pulmonary venous congestion so there will be sign of pulmonary venous congestion in the x-ray you do an echocardiogram you will find thickened immobile cusps reduced valve area of course the valve area will get reduced and the reduced rate of diastolic feeling of left ventricle. Large left atria, right ventricular hypertrophy. Again and again, I'm saying if you know the pathophysiology, if you know the hemodynamics, what is happening, okay, then you can really uh, describe the whole disease. Okay, you can describe all the findings, what you will get in case of all the investigations. Okay. Doppler echocardiography we will do. Again, Doppler is done to find out the severity of mitral stenosis, the gradient, pressure gradient across the mitral valve. We can also find out if there is pulmonary artery hypertension or not. Okay, and we can find out left ventricular function by looking at the left ventricular ejection fraction. Okay.
Lastly, cardiac catheterization we can do for the direct visualization. Coming to the treatment, okay. If I talk about the medical treatment, some lifestyle modification is necessary. We need to use, we need to restrict sodium, okay, and we need to use diuretics to relieve the patient of congestive symptoms, right? Penicillin to be used as secondary prophylaxis of rheumatic fever. If we think the patient uh, has rheumatic heart disease, then we need to give penicillin as a secondary prophylaxis of rheumatic uh, heart disease. I have already talked about the prophylaxis, secondary prophylaxis, how long you need to give, what you need to give, so I am not going to detail. If there is history of systemic embolism or if there is MS with AF, okay, need to give anticoagulants to prevent future stroke events, cardioembolic stroke. So anticoagulants in the form of warfarin you can use, warfarin. That is vitamin K antagonist. Vitamin K antagonist you need to use as an anticoagulant for to prevent cardioembolic stroke in case of mitral stenosis with aortic fibrillation. Okay. Or if there is any already any history of systemic embolism. If the patient develops atrial fibrillation, we need to use certain drugs like digoxin, beta blockers, and uh, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, okay. non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil, diltiazem can be used. Okay. Antibiotic prophylaxis against infective endocarditis is not routinely recommended until the patient falls into the high risk category. So, these are the medical things you can do. You need to do lifestyle modification, you ask for sodium restriction. If the patient has congestive symptoms, you give diuretics. If the patient has, uh, if you think the patient has rheumatic heart disease, give prophylaxis for rheumatic heart disease. If patient has atrial fibrillation, treat atrial fibrillation. If patient has sign of systemic embolization, give anticoagulants. Okay. So these are the very specific treatment as I have mentioned. You can really easily remember these things. Coming to the surgical management. Okay. Surgery also can be done for the mitral valve repair or mitral valve replacement can be Mitral valvuloplasty when to be done if the symptoms are significant. Patient has only MS. There is no MR. Okay, only MS, isolated MS, no MR. Mitral valve cusps are pliable, non-calcified, no subvalvular fusion. Beneath the valve, at the subvalvular level, lies the caudi tendony and papillary muscle. So there is no subvalvular fusion of caudi tendony and papillary muscle, and there should not be any thrombus in the left atria. If these things are followed, you go for a valvuloplasty. Otherwise, you need to do an open surgery. Okay. So isolated MS, no MR, pliable cusp, non-calcified valve, no subvalvular fusion left atria free of thrombus you do percutaneous intervention otherwise you need to go ahead with the surgery what is what is this image shows it shows pmbc pmbc stands for percutaneous mitral uh, balloon commissurotomy okay this is one of the very important procedures we do for mitral stenosis so how it is done, actually this is a catheter, okay, this is, a, this is the balloon which is deflated, okay. A balloon catheter is inserted through the inferior vena cava, this is IBC, into the right atria, this is the right atria. And a septal puncture is made, this is the interatrial septum. So in the septum, a puncture is made and through the puncture, the guide wire is inserted into the left atria, this is the left atria, okay. After inserting into the left atria, okay, it is inserted into the, like this, it is progressed into the left ventricle. After inserting into the left ventricle, the balloons are inflated in a stepwise fashion, okay. This area is inflated first and then this area gets inflated, okay. So, this is how a percutaneous mitral balloon commissurotomy is done, okay, without any open surgery and that is the uh, treatment of choice this days. Valvotomy, mitral valve replacement can be done. Mitral valve replacement and open surgical procedure. This is the 
management protocol for rheumatic mitral stenosis. I will not go into the detail of it because it is a little complicated at your level. So just know that in most of the cases you need to do percutaneous balloon mitral commissurotomy. Okay, percutaneous balloon mitral commissurotomy. If the patient's anatomy is not good and patient is not suitable for percutaneous intervention or if there is presence of clot inside the LA left atria if there is subvalvular stenosis in all these cases you need to do an open surgery you need to do mitral valve repair or replacement okay patient falls into the nyha stage three and four with severe symptoms okay then also you need to do mitral valve repair or replacement okay in case of progressive mitral stenosis that is mitral valve area more than still more than 1.5 centimeter square and patient is symptomatic then you may do periodic monitoring also if the there is no pulmonary hypertension okay so this is about the management in short mitral regurgitation the last topic of today so let's know what are the causes of mitral regurgitation what is mitral regurgitation first Mitral regurgitation, as like I have said in case of aortic regurgitation, mitral valve is unable to close properly. After the diastole ends, mitral valve is supposed to close. Okay, So mitral valve closes but there is a gap inside. So because of the gap, there is a leakage of blood from the left ventricle to the left atria. That is mitral regurgitation. Okay during systole it happens because as soon as the mitral valve gets closed that is the beginning of the systole so during systole there will be leakage of blood from the left ventricle to the left aorta uh, sorry left atria coming to the etiology of mitral regurgitation mitral regurgitation again it can be acute or chronic acute cases infective endocarditis papillary muscle rupture portal rupture blunt trauma these are very important causes of acute mitral regurgitation which requires acute intervention trauma infective endocarditis myocardial infarction leading to papillary muscle rupture caudal rupture okay, these are causes of acute mitral regurgitation chronic mitral regurgitation chronic regurgitation causes can be primary causes or secondary causes among the primary causes we have myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve which is also known as mitral valve collapse rheumatic fever, infective endocarditis healed, congenital and radiation exposure. These are causes of primary mitral regurgitation, primary MR. Secondary causes, what happens in secondary causes? There is no involvement of the leaflets of the mitral valve or caudal involvement. Whereas in primary, there is involvement of leaflets and caudi. So when leaflets are caudi not involved, but there is mitral regurgitation, that is known as secondary cause of mitral regurgitation. So what are the secondary cause? Ischemic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, HOCM stands for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, chronic atrial fibrillation with LA enlargement and annular dilatation. Lastly, mitral annular calcification. So these are the causes of secondary chronic mitral regurgitation. Coming to the pathophysiology, as I have said, there will be defective closure of the mitral valve backflow of blood through mitral valve, acute mitral regurgitation, left atrial pressure rises because of the backflow of blood from ventricle to atria, chronic mitral regurgitation, okay, the atria gets time for the compensation in chronic cases, so there is less rise in left atrial pressure, pulmonary edema, and cardiac failure so these are the things which happen in case of mitral regurgitation coming to the symptoms symptoms actually depends on the rapidity of onset if it is very rapid acute mitral regurgitation patient will present with dramatic symptoms of dyspnea okay so fatigue exertional dyspnea pulmonary edema orthopnea pmp raised jvp edema ascites palpitation why palpitation again mr patient are also prone for atrial fibrillation 
not only for atrial fibrillation, and regurgitant lesion also causes palpitation and thrombolytic complication. I will not discuss these clinical features in detail because already I have discussed all the features. Okay. Coming to the signs, JVP will be raised. Hyperdynamic left ventricle. It is again a case of volume overload, and because of volume overload, left ventricle will be hyperdynamic. Apical impulse will be shifted. Systolic thrill. Why systolic thrill? Because the regurgitation is occurring during systole, so there will be a systolic murmur. Palpable systolic murmur means thrill. On auscultation, S1 will be soft. If you compare with mitral stenosis, S1 was very loud in mitral stenosis, okay, but in case of MR, S1 will be soft. So please remember the difference. S2 will be widely split, okay, just the opposite of mitral stenosis. Prominent S3 will be there, which hollow systolic murmur, hard best at apex with the radiation. Okay, that is the murmur of mitral regurgitation. It will be hollow systolic, means whole throughout the systole. Why hollow systolic? Because the regurgitation occurs whole throughout the systole. So the murmur also will be there, whole throughout the systole. Hollow systolic, high pitch murmur, best hard at the cardiac apex, and there is radiation to the axilla. If, when the patient develops congestive failure, patient develops hepatomegaly, ankle edema, ascites, crepitations, pulmonary edema, and fusions. These are all signs of congestive failure. Coming to the investigations, the same, you do an ECG, you do a chest x-ray, you do an echocardiogram, you do a Doppler study, you do a cardiac catheterization. And by now, I'm sure you can write down what are the findings you will get because it is almost all similar okay with all the other valvular disease i have described you just need to concentrate on the pathophysiology of the particular valvular involvement then you can really write like just for example in eco what will be the finding okay there will be dilated left atria left ventricle and structural abnormalities of the mitral valve so you can definitely write if you know the pathophysiology coming to the treatment the medical treatment is just same like mitral stenosis I have seen for secondary prophylaxis of rheumatic fever if the cause is rheumatic heart disease then you give penicillin systemic embolization history or MR with F anticoagulation okay best is vitamin K antagonist atrial fibrillation you treat with digoxin non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and beta blockers Pulmonary edema, you give diuretics and vasodilators. Antibiotic prophylaxis against infective endocarditis is not routinely required, but in high risk cases, you need to provide the prophylaxis. Okay. Surgical intervention. What are the surgical interventions you can do? You can do a valvotomy, you can do a valvoplasty and valve replacement, or you can repair the mitral valve. Okay. So, this is the protocol of uh, managing mitral regurgitation again I will not go into the detail but most of the time when the patient has developed severe mitral regurgitation patient requires mitral valve repair okay mitral valve surgery so surgery 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 repair okay surgery so most of the time just remember that most of the time when has developed patient has developed severe mitral regurgitation you need to advise the patient to go for a surgical intervention in cases of secondary mitral regurgitation and if the patient is asymptomatic then you may think of periodic monitoring right so this is about the management of mitral regurgitation so thank you so much here ends the class i hope you really enjoyed the class i hope so